Hello everyone and welcome to Behind Massive Screens, a game development podcast here from Massive Entertainment in Malmo, Sweden. My name is Petter. This guy's Dory. That's me. That's you. We have a guest. But first, I want to tell you about a dream I had last night. Oh, Ooh, the, I, these conversations are, can always be so dangerous. Yeah, very dangerous. It's not that bad. Um, I dreamt that a guy on my team, Yuan, was inviting us and some imaginary person to um, a voice recording. I don't know what for. Uh, and then I woke up. So that's the end of the dream. But it was 4 a.m. I was really groggy. And I started to think, did I miss the, the behind the massive screens so recording? That's, that's why you weren't there on Thursday. Oh, God damn it. I did miss something. <laughs> no, there's this deep anxiety. Did I just go home? <laughs> and then I realized, wait, we have one more day of work left. I didn't miss anything. Yeah, that, that is like an, in, an indication of... Uh, we're doing a lot of podcasts. We're doing a lot of recordings. We were, when you start dreaming <laughs> of, of meetings that aren't even happening. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, we're ruined by the podcast. Anyway, let's move on to the guest. Yeah, and do the podcast. <laughs> and do the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> do the actual podcast. Okay. Uh, welcome, Martha. Thank you. Associate Art Director here at Massive Entertainment. How are you doing? Good. Very good. Very busy. Well, yeah. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> you'll start dreaming about work yeah. as well. You probably already, <laughs> already are. Do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's great to have you. Uh, art is always, uh, we had concept artists on, for example, it's always super exciting uh, to talk about this. Um, so we're gonna just going to jump right in, right? Yeah. The, the dream part is the banter. We're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Banter, check. Banter, check. Uh, <laughs> guest introduction, check. Yeah. Uh, F- first question, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so generally, the first question we always ask is, on a on a top level, just as a, a general description, what does an art director actually do? So yeah, an art director is works together with the art teams to establish and and manage the art direction of the game. Right. So basically, what I do is I work with all the art teams, so not just concept art, but like all the art related teams, and I. Um, work together with them and keep an eye on like the style and like uh, the quality and everything like that and uh while working together with them determining like it's going to be like this or we're going to go for that direction or we're going to make it more moody in this shot you know that kind of stuff yep. um really keeping the overview so it's actually very broad um i used to work before as a concept artist so that was just one part of it and now as an art director, it's it's much more holistic. So you're much more involved in, you know, having an overview of the whole project and making sure that every everybody's on the same page and we all get to the uh, the the final direction that we all agree with. Yep. Yeah. So so it's a question of of not only helping or not helping, but but shaping the the visual style of the game itself, but it's also during production making sure that those guidelines are kept to and everybody is on point exactly exactly so it really starts with you know pinpointing what we actually want to do and i don't do that by myself i work together with everyone on that uh and then it's really about keeping an eye on that to make sure that we keep that direction because you know you work with so many different teams so many different people everybody has their own you know idea of what it's going to look like and you need someone who keeps an eye on that and make sure that we are all uh, working on the same uh, same direction yeah it's, it's, we'll get back to more <laughs> practical details of how to keep everybody in line stylistically uh, in a little bit. But the thing is, I, we we had a pre-interview, so we know parts of the answer you're going to give. But I think a lot of people at home, people at home listening to this, mm. you, uh, dear viewer, will be really interested in parts of your background because it's super fascinating. So let's go okay. for the next question we always <laughs> ask. How did you end up at Massive Entertainment? Yeah, so that's that's was quite a journey. If if we start completely from the beginning, um, that that's the idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, it wasn't my plan to end up in games at the beginning. I was studying uh, archaeology, so I wanted to become an archaeologist actually. Um, but while I was studying that, I was always drawing, and I, you know, the reason why I liked archaeology was because of all the the visual parts of it as well. You know, the architecture and the, the design and and art that was related to that. And uh, that made me realize that maybe, you know, I should do something with that. I was right. graduating and I thought, well, I, I, I'm not ready yet to, to, you know, work in a museum or something like that. 
Um, so I did a, another uh, a course uh, art, at art school, um, uh, game development, game design and development in uh, the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, that really clicked. I mean, uh, then I knew okay, I'm going to work in games. Um, and um, while uh, studying game design, I had the opportunity to go on an exchange as well to Japan. And I really wanted to do that because um, I really like Japanese games in general. Um, but I also really like the art style and like, uh, you know, uh, in Holland, you learn a lot about ideation and it's really about, you know, uh, coming up with the uh, original ideas and that kind of thing. It was less about technique, like just, you know, drawing. Um, so that I, I thought like, if I go to Japan, I could learn that. So that's why I went on this exchange. It was very hardcore. It was a manga school in Kyoto and oh, it was wow. mm -hmm. six days a week, uh, school morning until six uh, and the whole day drawing so it was quite uh, different from what i was used to but it was a fantastic experience i learned a lot and i learned to draw uh, very traditionally with ink um, and was very valuable and um, after i graduated i wanted to go back to japan because i wanted to learn more i wanted to find out more um, especially because uh, japanese video games they have some mystery around it they always have some i don't know they're very interesting to me they are sort of unexpected or surprising in some ways and i just wanted to know like how do they actually make those games like how do they, they approach game development because i learned in, in school how to do it like uh, in the western way i would say and i really wanted to know how they did that in japan so after graduating i um, did another year at the same uh, university in kyoto um, focusing more this time on uh, game development. Um, and I worked uh, with a team of students there on a PS Vita game. It was, uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know <laughs> uh, what time that was. Um, and after uh, that year, um, uh, I started applying for different jobs there as well. Uh, in Japan, it's very uh, common that game companies come to art schools and they just check your portfolios and, you know, uh, talk to the students because in Japan, it's more of a system that when you graduate, you go to a company uh, where you get another three years of training and then you're like a full employee. And the, the, the idea is that you stay at a company like forever. Yeah. So they, they really invest in, in, you know, teaching you for three years all the in, ins and outs of game development after you graduated from art school. Like a paid internship or? Yeah, kind yeah. of like that. Yeah, hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of like that. And it's, uh, it's uh, a long time. And because it's in, in the company where you're going to work at, you will learn like everything you need to know about, you know, the engine and like every, every work process of that company you will learn in those three years. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting system. Um, um, but during those, one of those visits it was all kinds of companies. There was from software, there was Capcom. Um, uh, I did, I tried to <laughs> apply it from software as well. Um, but, and they actually invited me to, uh, to an interview. Uh, so I went to Tokyo to talk to the art director. I was, oh my God, you know, this is, wow, this is happening. But, um, he asked me a question and I, at that point, my Japanese was really bad. And I had no idea what he was saying. It was like the worst <laughs> thing ever. I was sitting in this room and I had no idea. What, and I like, like, oh, and then, you know, he just gave up after a while. And it was just, okay, well, you know, you can go home now. <laughs> like We're going like, to teach oh. you a lot, but <laughs> yeah, the language. Uh, you know, and that's, that's when I realized that you need to learn the language. If no. you work in Japan, you need to speak Japanese. They don't speak English. It's, you know. So I studied that very hard and I eventually um applied at capcom as well i was a big monster hunter fan so i wanted to work there as well and that actually uh went really well mm. the interview and everything was yeah went, went really how, well. how long in between so you you say you studied japanese very hard like how so uh in between the from software interview and the capcom it was about half a year okay and then i had i had a very hardcore schedule so i was studying japanese and from the morning until four o'clock or something and then yeah. after that i would do my school work and then in the evening i would work on my portfolio and that was like for months wow <laughs> it was like nice. that <laughs> not a lot of sleep it was really you know if i want to do this i need to yeah. need to really go for it 
Um, and yeah, and that's when I ended up in Capcom, uh, where I worked for five or six years. Um, so that was when I started to really work in, in game development. Um, but after uh, six years, I, I really wanted to try something else, you know, and I, I at that point, I kind of got an idea of what Japanese game development is about. And I wanted to experience other companies as well to be able to sort of see like what can you learn from from how different companies work and and, and you had been working as a concept artist yeah i was a concept company. artist yeah and i actually skipped the three years of training <laughs> i was about to ask you said you, you said there five six years yeah. and and were three of those training but no 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 they actually hired me like just full-on employee uh, right away yeah that hardcore <laughs> schedule paid off <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i did my time exactly <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess for foreigners, it's a little bit different, sure. uh, in general, in, I mean, um, for a for foreigner, you, it's a different experience in the team yeah. than for Japanese. They, they do see you definitely as an outsider. So there is a little bit of different rules that go for uh, foreigners, but, um, uh, yeah, so I, I could skip that and just work as a concept artist, uh, uh full time, uh, at Capcom and I worked on, on many exciting projects like Dragon's Dogma and Monster Hunter. That was my dream. Yeah. I did that. I worked on that. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was really, really A cool. lot of ears have perked up. Yeah. It, it started <laughs> with a mention of From Software. You can just hear people like, hmm. Mm. And, and, and then, and then when, once uh, Dragon's Dogma came up, I was like, ooh. Well, exactly. There's <laughs> more. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, we can dive into that, but <laughs> we're still not at the we're point. Still, we're, not, we're, we're still not a massive. <laughs> we're still not a massive. So, um, yeah. So after <laughs> after Monster Hunter World was finished, um, that's when I started to look around, and CD Projekt was hiring, and they were working on Cyberpunk, and I was living in Japan. I was making a lot of photos as well there. Like uh, at night, I would walk outside and, and make photos of, of the city, and then that was but super. Wait, uh, is this in Tokyo now or uh, no. Capcom is in Osaka. Kyoto? Osaka. 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 Okay. We're, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The school was in Kyoto and uh, Capcom uh, was in Osaka. Okay. Um, so I had a lot of these uh, these cyberpunk photos and, and, you know, I thought, well, and I love, love Witcher 3. It was like, oh, I love the game. So um, I applied there and, and, and eventually started to work there as well as a concept artist and later as a lead as well. Uh, and that was amazing as well. Worked on cyberpunk, uh, and uh, I was mostly involved in like uh, environment, uh, concept art, environment design, that kind of stuff. So the city building. Yeah. And after cyberpunk was done, I thought, no, now it's time for the next step. <laughs> and I really wanted to go to Scandinavia, uh, yeah. not only because it's very, very beautiful, but I really wanted to know also about what it's like working in Scandinavia. I right. heard really good things about it, so. That's pretty um, good. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what were you saying? What was it like? We're not going to compare too much, but generally your experience of working in Japan, uh, because you say it, it's kind of different from, from foreigners in Japan. Uh, of course, the other way around as well. But what was, what was it like? It was amazing. Uh, it was very exciting. Uh, I think you hear all these stories about working in Japan and how hardcore it is. And, that's all true. <laughs> it actually is. I mean, it wasn't, um, it was quite normal to stay at work until 10 o'clock in the evening right. uh, or longer. Um, and at the beginning, I actually did that because, you know, I, I was the only foreigner in the team and I thought I need to you know, adjust to, you know, this space. And uh, I stayed until nine or 10 every day. Um, but after a while, I noticed that you don't really have to do that. It's more like, so like people think like you have to work uh, very long hours in Japan and it's quite hardcore, but it's really up to you. Uh, at some point I just went home at six, for example, and that was fine as well. Yeah. Um, but it's also, there was this culture in the company that everybody um, is sort of a family and you kind of stay at work, you know, like constantly hardworking and, you know, you wouldn't be able to if you make those hours, but it was more like also hanging out mm -hmm. and work, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. We would go out and eat something in a nice uh, restaurant around the company and just come back after and just hang out there at the company. Uh, you know, people live quite small in Japan. My apartment was tiny. And then it's actually very nice to to hang out <laughs> with, with people in the, in the company. So it was it was kind of a different take on that, I think. 
uh, than what you expect. Um, but it was really, it really, I think it really shaped the way how I approach game development. Mm -hmm. I think um, in Japan, um, the first thing they learned me was um, you're, you're a game creator first and then you are a concept artist or a sound designer or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. you are. But first you're a game creator. So everything you do, you have to approach it as if you are making this entire game, not just your piece of it. Right. And for me, that meant uh, when I made concepts that I always, it wasn't about the way it looked. It was also about, you know, what would the player do here? What's the gameplay? Do I have any ideas of the gameplay? Um, or even like the music, I would sometimes have an idea about, you know, it would be cool if the player entered this castle and then you would hear this kind of music suddenly start playing and that kind of stuff. It was very uh, holistic in mm -hmm. that sense. Um, and I, I still really try to do that in, in my work now and to approach everything first, like, okay, you know, what would be good for the game as a whole and not just, you know, what would look cool. Right. I mean, I'm focused on, on art, of course, but I still, I think it's very important to approach it as a, as a, in, in like, um, the, very holistically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that approach. It's like making it usable and functional and in the in, you know to give the game agency right from the start rather than just making a really cool sketch and then like well it doesn't quite work in uh, with our mechanics stuff yeah exactly and it's like they told i was making when i was working on dragon's dogma i was making these like, nice castles and they were huge and they were like these shots from above and they were telling me no marta you know the player will walk down there so we need to make sure it looks cool from down there so please make a drawing <laughs> From actual player perspective, and for me, it was like, oh yeah, maybe I should do that. And then, <laughs> uh, then you start designing really differently because then you start, you know, placing the interesting stuff actually on eye level instead of these super nice, you know, bar shots. And um, it's the same way how we approached uh, in Cyberpunk uh, Night City design. We we really made sure that it looked cool from player perspective when you were driving through the city right. um, and not just making a nice sketch of like a huge city. We made everything on scale, for example, in the concept art, we were building the whole city in 3D and everything was on scale for the player. And that was a way to really see how the player would experience, uh, you know, these environments. Um, and you can still make very cool pictures uh, in that way, but it's just a different way of approaching it. Um, and I think that's a very important thing to uh, keep in mind when you're an artist. We're not going to talk too much about, about uh, other games that are not developed here, but at the same time, I have to ask, um, because uh, you worked on Dragon's Dogma, for example, you applied for From Software. And one thing that you can see, and especially, and, and it's been said by the creators of, of Dark Souls, for example, that they are taking, they're, they're doing a Japanese game but at the same time, they're taking so much inspiration from Western games. So it becomes this kind of melting pot mm -hmm. of, of influences into one, which then in turn creates this really unique experience. Um, what were you able to bring yourself? We're talking a lot about, okay, th this is what life in Japan is like, culture uh, or work culture in Japan. But what did you bring with you to, from, yeah. from your background? That's uh, yeah, that's very interesting because I think uh, one of the reasons also why I found a job in Japan uh, was because I had a foreign background and that was actually interesting. My art style was different. I was not drawing a manga style, uh, even though I went to a course. I still had a very you know my own way of uh, of drawing and painting, and that I think was super interesting for them. So I got a lot of freedom to design stuff. Uh, my way and my knowledge of, of, you know, especially for Dragon's Dogma, which was very much based on, on European medieval, uh, you know, cities and stuff like that. I could really use that experience of living in Europe, you know, my background there, my knowledge of the castles uh, in, in the designs. And I think that was very valuable in creating this mix. Yep. Uh, and um, I think that really, yeah, uh, helped shape uh, the games as well. Um, it was also very funny that uh, one thing we realized when I was working on Dragon's Dogma was, for example, when they were Googling uh, castles, uh, if you Google it in Japanese, you get very different results than mm. if you Google it in English, for example. So they had like a very different reference library. 
uh, for a lot of these things. And it was, yeah, was very helpful to, for them, I think, to have someone to point out, like, you know, that's not actually what it looks like, or, you know, the, you, the results you're getting are much more Japanese based, because if right. you Google in Japanese, you will get Japanese websites and uh, you get very different results. Um, and, you know, I think if you live somewhere, you have this experience, you know, all the details there, um, that just helps in, in designing, uh, artistically. Uh, video games i think that's why i think traveling is, is super important if you're an artist um because actually going to these places and experiencing them and also you know the sounds you hear when you go somewhere or the smells you can smell it, all that stuff is super important when you are designing and creating game worlds uh i think those experiences are very valuable and i think that's that's something that i could add to 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 for example during Stogma. Or Monster Hunter. Yeah. It's like, uh, I think we've quoted Eddie Ezzard before, in Europe, we're up to here with castles. <laughs> I have so many. You just trip over <laughs> them everywhere. Um, but how come you went from, uh, moving a little bit away from Japan? You said you uh, started out uh, as a concept artist. Uh, you drew a lot. Like, how did you go from, what led you from concept art to actually to art direction and art directing? I think it's because, um, well, I, I don't think like being a concept artist means that you will eventually become an art director. I don't think there's like a natural this line. path. I don't think, I think it's, it's really a choice. Mm. <laughs> you know, you can, you can either become uh, like a, like a very accomplished uh, expert concept artist that inspires the team with their artwork, or you can go more into art direction where it will also be quite some management and you're more like also into that that you like to work with different teams and managing and um it kind of developed that way because uh i think from the beginning i approached the art always very holistically because mm. that's how i was taught in japan for example but just that's also uh, my interest um that naturally led to me becoming a lead concept artist mm. uh so taking more also of the managing of the team i really like to work with people and you know I think it's also a role of an art director to inspire your team as well, to make, you know, you're not there to just tell them what to do. You're working together with them. They are the experts, you know, you want to get all the ideas from the team. And um, I really enjoy doing that. And I think so for me, that was sort of a natural progression to grow into that. And it wasn't like I had this goal, like I want to become an art director. It just went sort of naturally into that direction. I was an idiot. I put paper clips on our notes. So now you're <laughs> going to hear me shuffling the papers. So I'm just going to remove the paper clip. I'm, I'm sorry for all the yeah. audio listeners out there. You, you're letting them know that we have notes. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> damn it. We, we actually. No, have, I mean, we actually, we, we, when we're talking to somebody that has such a varied uh, and deep history mm -hmm. where, where there's so many things <laughs> that we want to talk about, it's like, it's it's easy to forget. Stuff. So we, yeah, we, 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 we need the bullet notes. points <laughs> to help us. Like, oh, yeah, we wanted to talk. For example, I, we, I mean, we were moving kind of beyond Japan, but I see here a uh, a note <laughs> about Resident Evil 7. Yeah. <laughs> and you actually managed to get a little bit of yourself into the game. Yeah, I, I'm actually in the special things in the credits, and I will tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, so it's actually very funny because um, my partner was uh, working on, on Resident Evil. Uh, he also worked in Japan and later joined in Capcom as well. And he worked on, on Resident Evil. And um, I was helping out because, um, you know, in the game, I, I don't know if you played Resident Evil 7, but there is this, um, uh, this uh, girl who gets uh, kidnapped uh, and you have to find her. And um, they needed someone to be sort of a stand-in for this character before we got like an official actor to be scanned. And of course, there were no foreigners in the entire company, except for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they asked to scan me, 3D scan me. There's a 3D scan of me. That's, that's, it's really weird. I have a 3D model of myself, uh, actually. You know. <laughs> but um, they scan, at first, they, they put me in like all the makeup of a zombie. Because she's, she's basically turned into a zombie. Mm. Um, and that was fun in itself, like uh, all the blood and like scars and everything. So you not only have a 3D model of yourself, you have a 3D model <laughs> of yourself. In covered in, in gore in and covered zombie in gore and yes exactly 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, and yeah, and then they they three D scanned me, and I was in the game for like a long time until they actually got like a, an official actress to to take on this role, and she she's uh, now in in the game. But it was me the whole time, which was very disturbing to see because okay. you know she's I don't. She's scary as she all is. Hell. She is uh. incredibly scary and. You know, the player actually, uh, you know, he punches her and he like chainsaw and all that stuff. But the 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 worst thing or like the funniest thing was that so my partner was working on this game and they needed, you know, it's a first person game and you see the hands and they needed to scan someone's hands and they wanted like Western hands. And my, my partner is also Dutch. So they asked to scan his hands and they're actually in the game, you know, the hands of the protagonist are actually part of my partner's hands. Um, but so that meant that at some point when we were testing the game, you would see his hands. He was like strangling my <laughs> 3D model. He was like sawing off my head. And this, oh my God, it was very <laughs> it was incredibly did, did, disturbing to see. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I helped. <laughs> Can we can we get Martin's partner in here? I just want to sit and compare hands. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put up the game. I want the computers to play. <laughs> And then get, is, wonder if the assets are still in the game somewhere. Mm. Oh, I mean, I wonder if you can send an email. Can I, can I get the 3D model of me? Yeah. You know, yeah. throw it up in Blender, have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, aren't you glad that I brought up the notes yeah. so you could just segue <laughs> into, hey, Love there's, it. This, there's Love this it. note here. Otherwise we would have missed that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you also had a personal helmet and survival kit yeah. with instant ramen under your desk. Yes. Because of earthquakes. Earthquakes, yeah. That's a thing <laughs> <laughs> in Japan. Yeah, and it, when I when I joined Capcom, it was actually right after, you know, the big earthquake in 2011. I joined in 2012. Um, so there were actually still these sort of aftershocks mm. in, in Japan going on. Mm. Um, and so... It was very important that everybody had their own helmet. I had a helmet with my name written on it. So, you know, they could sort of know who was, you know, saved when <laughs> you were outside. Um, but also uh, the Capcom building is really, really tall building. Like I was on floor 14 or something. Um, and we did have our earthquakes. And then it's like you're in a boat. Like yep. The whole thing is just, oh, it was super scary. And things start to fall over. Um, and we had a survival package underneath our desk and it had this sort of well it wasn't instant ramen it was like a curry and it had this sort of um uh, stuff in there and it was sort of chemicals that you put together and then it cooks the curry <laughs> and then you can <laughs> get like a nice hot curry while you're like stuck in a building um did but you ever it, try it yeah i tried <laughs> <laughs> i had to try it so at some point i just can i try you know how this works um that was pretty good it was fun. yeah but um but that was like uh, that was very important um yeah. it was a danger it was sometimes super scary if you would go into like this cramped bookstore and suddenly there's an earthquake and mm. everything starts to fall off and you're in between and like, that was uh could be quite stressful uh, uh, i, I stayed in tokyo for a couple of months many many years back and i remember waking up to an earthquake and i, I thought i'm going home I'm, I'm leaving the country. I'm never coming back. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, the most disturbing thing. And the sounds you hear from a yeah, building it's when it's swaying and you hear all that Whoa. noise. Like, oh. All the creaking. And yeah. It was the worst. Yeah. It's very, yeah. yeah. As an art director, uh, before we kind of get into the whole, we want to know what you do on a day to day and it's when you sit down. But we talked about style at the beginning. Mm -hmm. How do you manage to like stay on style? Because you have different people. They have slightly different styles like how do you make sure that everything is is if not similar then coherent uh, i think it's very important very important to have um to establish the art direction really early mm. in the process and having the documentation uh and to be honest a massive it's awesome the documentation i'm like so impressed but um to really establish uh what you want uh, what kind of direction you want. And it doesn't have to be super specific because it's very interesting to see what artists come up with mm. and to leave that freedom to the artist that actually helps a lot in you know, making the game even better. Um, and I think it's very important also to add to that the things that you don't want. And sometimes I think um, that can be a crucial element uh, 
when you help making mood boards, for example, you also include the things like, I don't want it to be this style, but you know, I want, for example, if you're having to design uh, armor designs for, uh, say you're working on a uh, from software game, um, you know, it's going to be dark and gritty. So you have all these, these examples of that. And then you kind of need to pinpoint also what it's not going to be like. So, you know, it's not going yeah, to be super where shiny. Where is the line? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Don't add lights to it or, you know, that kind of stuff will really help, uh, you know, set the boundaries, I think, yeah. for the artists. Within that boundaries, they can be super creative. And it actually helps to sometimes, you know, know what not to do. Uh, will create uh, maybe more creative solutions. Mm. Um, so that really helps uh, a lot. Uh, and that, that really goes for concept art. I think later in the project, you really need to, to really dive into the details to make sure that everything looks like the same. Yeah. Uh, the more, the closer you come to the end product, it's becoming more and more zooming in on the details and uh, making sure it's all in line. But the starting point is the concept art. So if you nail it there, it will be much easier also in the rest of the process to make sure that everything uh, looks the same, looks, looks like uh, it's from the same project. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when I, when I think about concept art not having been, uh, you know, in game development myself, it, like f first when I think of it, I think is that something that happens like at the start of the project? But I'm, I'm getting the feeling more and more that, no, a concept artist that is throughout the process is like whenever something new is needed, you go to the concept artist first. Uh, yeah, and not only that, I think the role of the concept artist changes throughout the whole production cycle. There's like um, different phases you go through during the development of a game and the role of the concept artist adjusts to that. So in the, at the beginning, they're really like working on the designs, ideation and that kind of stuff. But at a certain point when you're really in production, it's a very supportive role. So it's helping also overpainting environments or mm. overpainting characters that are modeled to make sure, you know, uh, to kneel down the style of the game, for example. Uh, and it becomes a very, uh, like very collaborative with all other teams. And later on in the process, towards the end of the development cycle, it will be more about uh, also helping with lighting, for example, making lighting uh, paintings, like how mm. do we light this scene or, helping with cinematics, helping with sound effects, even like um, uh, we made uh, drawings to, for cyberpunk, for example, of scenes where there's a car driving down the road and you can see all the stones uh, sort of uh, skipping away from the road. So you can imagine, okay, we need a sound effect here when it's driving this fast on this sandy road, you will need this and this and this. Um, so it's very, you know, every stage of the project will have a different need from the concept artist. Mm. Um, and it's really their role to be supportive, I think, uh, to the rest of the team. I think this is great, though, because you you mentioned so many different teams now, everything from, from audio, cinematics, uh, lighting, all that. The, we kind of make a point every time we record these episodes about how much, one, how much everything is interconnected, like all the different teams always interact with each other at the end of the day. And also, I know you perked up when you heard about the car. Because we used the car in a <laughs> recent episode as an example of VFX, and it was it was all about rocks and stuff coming out of oh, the, yeah. the wheels. So See? we're super See? happy. Yeah, someone's been listening to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we did have we did an episode about uh, concept art a long time ago. Now it feels like like eleven, twelve episodes ago. Um, but one thing they were we talked a lot about then was the idea of concept art as communication mm -hmm. and that it's, yep. it's a way to get people excited both within and, and outside the project to make sure that you, uh, Topi was talking about going into a meeting room with execs who, who didn't understand the game, uh, until he was there to show them the, the concept. Yeah. Art. And as an art director, it feels like you're kind of helping steering that whole Yep. communication yep. with other teams no yep. yeah exactly and i think uh, that's why i think our direction works very closely with the concept team yep. um because they can help uh you know that communication is super important inspiring the team as well motivating the team if they see like oh my god this is what it's going to be like you know this is what we're going to work towards uh it's a very close collaboration and for me that was actually quite a, a thing i needed to learn when i became uh, art director I was always concept artist, so I was always the one who was doing the images. 
And now I kind of had to step back and let that go and let the artist make the image. Um, that, that can't have been easy. Yeah, it was quite, yeah. It, I mean, I, of course, when I worked as a lead, there was already less and less time for me to actually do the drawing. Um, so in that sense, it wasn't a big shock, but it was kind of, yeah, you know, letting go <laughs> of that. And I still tend to sometimes think like, okay, I'll just do like a quick sketch and, you know, I will I'll, I'll just take this concept or something. Um, but I think the concept artists are so talented here that I can totally rely on them. They can make better things than I would be able to make. So um, that's amazing. And I think that's, that's really, really cool. Um, they're really helping also into, I think, you know, art directors don't always have the answers. Um, they don't know like exactly what they want. I always thought like, oh, you know, they're going to tell me what they want and then I will just make that. But it doesn't really work like that. It's like sometimes we also have like no clue. We want something like this. And then having these artists that come up with all these ideas and show you all these, these different uh, propositions. That's also super inspiring to me, for example. Mm, yeah um and then yeah it just really helps and then you know picking the ones that will work the best and that's the one that you will communicate to the team mm. that's the images that the teams will also see um yeah that process is just very exciting and fulfilling and i think that for me it kind of switched to you know doing my own drawings to helping the team make those drawings and inspiring them to do that and yeah. also be inspired by them um uh, that that's something that really makes me happy about this job yeah yeah and one thing that i'm kind of curious about there you, you talk about yeah making these drawings but then is uh, what is I, I don't know the industry standard or what what is it generally made with is it hand drawn are we talking 3d render or all of the above. <laughs> uh, it's all of the above, I would say. <laughs> but there, there is a bit of, I think in concept art, there's quite a development in techniques. Um, I mean, everybody is free to use their own technique. In the end, it's about solving the problems. I think as a concept artist, you're a problem solver, you're a designer. Mm. You're not necessarily an illustrator. So it doesn't really matter how you get to the end result, to be honest. You can, you can do it whatever in any way you want. But you can see that there are trends or like ways to do it that are more helpful or efficient. Um, when I started, I, I, I did everything in Photoshop, which is still legit. I mean, you can uh, definitely use that. Um, but at a certain point, I was using a lot of photos as well. When you work on more realistic uh, IPs, then you need to be, you, you know, you can use photos. But I think nowadays it's very common to work in 3D and you're making a 3D project. So... Yeah. You know, it really helps to design everything in 3D as well. Uh, and so a lot of artists are using 3D and I used it a lot as well. And that's now my go-to program is Blender. You know, that's that's how I, I make my designs now because I want to be able to turn around them. I want to be able to see them in different lighting, think about materials. What does a street lo look like at night versus at day? You know, that it's, it's much more efficient to do it that way. But... Everybody has their own process, to be honest, mm. as concept artists, and that's totally fine as well. well how how n now? Let's get into the the more nitty gritty yeah. details. I think because you're touching upon it already day, with, to, day. With yeah. day to day. Yeah, because I want to know. Like you, you said uh, earlier, we talked about documentation and stuff. You 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 mentioned um, being there at as early as possible uh setting down the ground rules for the art direction we we have a pet project here on the podcast which is this game about shooting red barrels that explode and then drive away in a car yeah yeah we, we've and been we, building we this through several episodes in several episodes <laughs> we started with vfx we have a ui now mm. which is fantastic <laughs> Um, yeah, we may have started on the wrong end. I think the one of the very first was VFX, and now we're looping back to the concept art. Yeah, it's, it's getting, <laughs> and our direction. It's getting weird. Uh, it currently, it just looks like an asset store flip. We've just been putting <laughs> red barrels and cars and stuff into it. But now we reached a point that we realize we have no idea what this looks like. Mm. Um, but so where do you even start? Like, okay, so our concept is really bad. It doesn't have a story. We haven't had a narrative person in yet. We maybe should. Get them here to actually tell us what it's about. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, but, we'll get one on the books. Yeah, we get it sooner or later. Um, but when, when would the and how would you get started 
uh, <laughs> with these very vague guidelines, <laughs> but generally yeah. in, a pro- in a game project, yeah. uh, when when you start doing the setting down the art direction of a game, mm-hmm. where do you even start? It's a yeah. I think you start quite well. It kind of depends on the project, to be honest. But let's just keep it general. Um, uh, at the very beginning, you actually work with the concept artist. There's no art direction yet. They're like. Maybe you have an idea of like what kind of game you want to make with red barrels and cars. Um, but <laughs> such then... A, such a, <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. I did not mean to laugh. It's just so stupid. Okay, come on. <laughs> and, but then you need to uh, establish like um, the style of it. Um, uh, if it's going to be very cartoony, I can imagine it could be. Maybe. Or very realistic. We don't, we, we don't know. The time yeah. period, all that stuff. Uh, but what helps is having a concept art team who starts just generating ideas. And uh, actually, our director at the beginning usually does that as well just making ideas and just having like this wall full of drawings and like things that like, oh, this, this is cool. Yeah. So and at then the beginning, go, yes, yeah. no, yes, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, With a stamp. R- like. Round two. <laughs> 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 well, kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so this beginning phase is really free um, and it's the most fun phase, I would say, <laughs> project. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Um, but that's also the phase where you're trying to establish and pinpoint what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, that's the most crucial moment, basically, in the in the process uh, of of the game development. That beginning that we're setting the boundaries of what what you know all uh, the time period, like I said, the the style, um, uh, the color palette that you're going to use. Um, all those elements will be established um, at the beginning um, together with the concept artist. As a role, as as an art director, you will be the one who puts together the things that work and try to put that in a frame, and that will be the base. That's the thing that will be communicated to the team and yeah, the like base the, for the, their... the style bible. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and of course, this the style bible it will grow throughout the project, and things will change as always. I mean, game development is very flexible, and that's you know things change uh, very often. Um, but you know, if you have this solid base, you can really build on top of that, and and that's that's the ideal uh, way of working uh, uh, when establishing our direction. Yeah, mm-hmm. cause, yeah, because I imagine when things are flexible and changing, if they're at least changing from a solid point exactly. where everybody knows these, where where is changing yeah. from, then the core pillars, you yeah. know, of the game that that are established in that in the beginning, and then you can start building on that and expanding it, and yeah. and so it comes. Being an art director and you're looking through the project, like you said, at kind of everything. That means that you're interacting with just about every single department. The VFX artists, yeah, lighting. Almost everything, yeah. Like you, you have notes for everybody. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I try to, to keep my notes mostly on the artistic things. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, you need to be involved also. Because, you know... For example, a story or a quest line also influences the way that an environment should look or mm. a character should look. And so you need to be uh, aware of all of this. Um, but in the end, I think it's, um, I'm like, I really rely on the team and the expertise of the team to come to like the best results. So it's not like I'm giving notes to everyone and everyone should do it like this. It's more like, Okay, I have all the, you know, I have the knowledge of all the different departments. Um, what you're showing me right now could work or could not work. Or I think if we, uh, you know, adjust it like that, then, you know, th- that will work with the story or something like that. Um, but in the end, it's uh, being inspired by the team. I think using their expertise and together you're kind of making this, this, um, the visual quality of the game. Um, I think that's very important to know. Like, it's not like, in my idea, it's not like the art director is just saying, like, you have to do this and you have to do this. And no, I don't want that. I want that. <laughs> no, it's not like that because it's so many different departments that are involved. So I really listen to what, you know, if, um, if there are notes from cinematic that they want something different on a character. And then, yeah, I will, I will look at that and see like, okay, yeah, actually that's a good idea that would enhance the scene a lot. So let's change that. Or maybe it doesn't work because, you know, that will break uh, another thing uh, further in the game. So let's not do it. Like, yeah. Or or if something new comes down from narrative, for example, something yeah. happens to a character and then you're like, oh, yeah, and then we can change the look to fit after yep. that story beat and yep. Yep. keep it still consistent. Yeah, exactly, exactly. 
So you're not you're not just sitting on a bean bag with like fashion books in your hands, <laughs> yelling at artists, like yes. trying to wrangle them. No, I want to be yes, that person. No, like, no. <laughs> oh, I ruined my dreams. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, one one quick question as well, because of course, when when games uh, get closer to the end of development, there's also user testing, and from that can come comments of well usability and like oh. Mm. We didn't know we could climb on these ledges mm -hmm. or something. And then I guess it comes back to, okay, how can we make that more understandable while keeping it within the art direction yep. of the game? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's super important as well to see how players react. And if they understand, you know, your art direction, we, we, you, you can make like ledges look very climbable. But if the player doesn't see it like that, you will need to adjust it in a way that it does make sense. And um, I think it's important to find a balance also between, you know, especially when you have uh, play tests to see like how much are we going to adjust uh, or how much are we going to keep uh, in our own, or, you know, what we had in mind. Um, so you don't adjust everything to like every, you, you can't just listen to every single feedback you get from every corner. You really need to pick the ones that you know will have a lot of impact on the playability of the game. And also, uh, you know, some things you might not change. And then maybe, yeah, for some people it might be harder to understand or for others it will be even more fun. I mean, it's, it's, that's quite difficult actually to, to decide like which things are important, that important on the visuals that we need to change it and which things are we just going to, to leave like that or are we going to, you know, do it in our own way or, um, yeah, I think that's yeah. a... Yeah, because, I mean, of course you don't want to get it too streamlined because no. then if you remove every single frustration then there's no satisfaction in figuring something no, out no. while playing the game you'll just end up with everything is blocks and then different colors for what you can interact with <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> It'll be very clear <laughs> yeah i mean yeah you, you could do that if that's like your style but i mean um yeah you don't want to and also you don't want to compromise too much like if you have a certain way you want to do it in a certain style you're not going to please everybody. You no. know, everybody has a different taste. So you really need to, you know, know what your core pillars are in your design. Like, what are the things that you really think are important that shape the visual of this game? The things that you need to stick to and the things that maybe you can adjust a little bit, you know, if, if that works better. But, you know, staying true to, to that visual direction that was established at the beginning, that's, that's a tough thing, but that's also, you know, the cool thing because you end up with this project that was yeah, you know the idea from the beginning that was our project and this is our style and this is what we want to make mm. uh, yeah so on a getting back to kind of the the day-to-day -day stuff like what what is the day generally like for an art director it's uh, very busy <laughs> <laughs> we tend to get that answer a lot yeah, yeah. um so uh, I usually have a lot of things with different teams to just go through what has been made and just see like what the progress is and give feedback if it's needed. Um, I also work a lot with the concept art team. Uh, I actually sit right around the concept art team um, to already anticipate like the next thing that we need to design or uh, what team needs support. So I'm also very involved in that. Um, it's a lot of different topics i think you need to be very able to switch to many different topics uh in the same day and for me that was something i really needed to get used to uh, as a concept artist i could just put on some music and work for like six hours on one drawing and that was like my day which was uh, yeah that's, that's fun too but now i, I really try to um, make sure every day that i'm kind of aware of what's going on and if someone needs anything, I'm there to to always uh, support them to find the references if they need more or like give notes, etc. Um, and yeah, that's that's I think nowadays that's basically how I fill my days. It's a lot of walking around the studio and uh, um, yeah. But speaking there about you know providing help and resources. Uh, for listeners out there, there are, uh, you know, upcoming artists and want to get into game development, either concept art or uh, want to work up to being an art director. Do you have some like resources uh, 
that you would, would point people towards where to begin? You're so good at segues in this episode. <laughs> oh, and then uh, you ruin them. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's my job. That's what I'm here for. I'm, I'm mentoring you. Um, <laughs> so for resources, I think um, one thing I think is important for, if you're interested in getting into game development and especially concept art, or art direction, um, it's really good if you have a broad knowledge of visual arts and not just games or that's, you know, you need to look beyond that because that's where you can get your inspiration. So, um, I always advise people to, to at least take their, uh, uh, camera with them everywhere they go. Um, it's the best way to not only be more aware of your environments and like details in that, because that's important when you're our director, you need to be aware of all the small details in an environment, for example, that makes it feel alive. And you need to be uh, totally aware of that and making photos in your own environment, in your own neighborhood will help with that. It's also a good practice for composition and lighting, for example. Um, but for real resources, yeah, I think that's why I would uh, recommend like uh, just going to websites of uh, photographers. Um, I looked a lot at, um, for example, um, uh, Bertinsky, uh, who did a lot of industrial photography and in very artistic ways. Uh, it's super inspiring, but there are many, many photographers with different uh, uh, fo focus uh, points uh, in their work that you can look at. Um, Another resource I use a lot is uh, the website called Shot Deck. They have a um, ginormous amount of movie shots uh, in their database. But the good thing is that you can search for shots based on the camera lens, the camera angle, the lighting, the composition. Like that really, if you just dive into that, that really helps you understand why a certain shot looks the way it does you know camera angles and that kind of things is also super important and how you frame you know a scene for example um yeah and in general i think the best way to to really uh grow that database in your head of visuals uh, is to travel and I don't mean that you have to travel very far. I can, Sweden has fantastic environments, to be honest. I mean, you can go up north. That's already really cool. But even around Malmö, it's like there's these castles around here and forests. And Not I was here. <laughs> 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 and I was, I was uh, uh, in Boxkogen last yeah, weekend. Yeah, Boxkogen. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. It's a so good inspiration to just go there and take photos. And uh, you'll have references already for your next project, basically. Um, but just going to places and experiencing them, I think, is is very important because that feeling, it, it's not just about things looking cool. You also have to incorporate, you know, the feeling of being there. What if you were walking in that environment? How would that feel? And is there a way to convey that? And a concept art is maybe just an image, but if you're working in art direction, you will think about, you know, the lighting, you will think about the movement, how the player moves through this environment, what they will hear, all those elements. I think the best way to get a hang of that is to really just go out there and walk around those environments and go to those places and experience them. Yeah. Yeah. And then all in the meantime, taking photos and drawing sketches and, and documenting that. Yeah, as well. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then once you, when you, once you get started, always think like a game creator. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for coming, Martha, associate art director, professional zombie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing having you. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. It was super fun. Of course. We had, the, again, we say it every time, but there are so many holes we could dig into this. <laughs> I still have so many unanswered questions, but we're kind of running out of time. Yeah. Sadly. I mean, we, we, we keep kind of breaking the, the record of, of how long the podcast is. And I'm always like, <laughs> I mean, it could be three hours. Man. <laughs> <laughs> we plenty to talk about. It. But, yeah. you know, we got to keep it consumable. Yeah. So to wrap up, like, subscribe, rate, review. Hit the bell. Hit the bell. <laughs> I keep forgetting about the <laughs> bell. I don't use it myself. You don't have to push the bell. Sorry. Did I ruin YouTube for you now? We always push the bell and that's why you should too. You should too. Always push the bell. See you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>